the Antarctic is simply remarkable. The sense of wilderness, the sense of isolation. Once you come here, it changes you forever. It has to be seen to be believed. This is southern Argentina, a mixture of rugged natural beauty and old world charm. The gateway portal city to the southern ocean. I'm in Ushuaia right now. It's the southernmost city in the world in Argentina. Tomorrow, I board the ship and head to the Antarctic. Ushuaia is an adventurer's mecca, a small town on Argentina's southern coast, nicknamed the end of the world. The windswept town is perched on a steep hill and surrounded by mountains. It's also the gateway to the Antarctic. So this is my home, the academic Vavilov. It's an ice-reinforced Russian ship. It's excellent for rough seas. An Antarctic adventure is an epic journey, a milestone in any traveler's bucket list. As we pass through the Beagle Channel, we are treated to an amazing sunset, worthy of the land we depart. Tierra del Fuego, Spanish for the land of fire. The Drake Passage is the wildest and most dangerous body of water in the world. It's a two-day crossing where you never forget you're on a ship. It can be so rough, it's a bit like stepping into a washing machine, with swells often reaching 15 meters high and winds howling over 300 kilometers an hour. It's a wonder anything lives, let alone thrives out here. But they do. The world is covered by about 70% ocean. And yet, if you were to look at all of the species of birds on the planet, only about 3% would be considered open ocean birds. And there's probably a good reason for that. Those birds have to deal with some of the nastiest weather conditions on the planet out in the open ocean. It's hard to believe, but there's a bird that lives out here for years at a time, only returning to the land to breed and to raise its young. In fact, it's a bird that will cross the ocean for breakfast. By the time an albatross reaches the ripe old age of 50, it will log at least six million kilometers. That's like flying to the moon and back eight times. With the longest wingspan of any bird, the wandering albatross is a master at riding ocean waves. So much so, in one feeding, an albatross may travel 6,000 kilometers in search of food. That's like flying from Chicago to Las Vegas for lunch. By the time an albatross reaches the ripe old age of 50, it will log at least 6 million kilometers. That's like flying to the moon and back eight times. So how do they cover such great distances? Two words, dynamic soaring. Winds along the surface of the ocean are actually layered with the slowest winds closest to the water. When the albatross flies and it needs to gain a little bit of speed, it banks up over the crest of a wave, allowing that faster wind to pull it up 10 or 15 meters above the water. It banks and uses that increased energy to sustain its flight. And it does that over and over and over again. Technically, it uses less energy flying than it does sitting on the nest. 
a living, breathing kite. No strings attached. Sailors used to believe that albatross had magical powers. They also believed that if they saw an albatross flying over a ship or following the ship, that it contained the souls of long lost mariners. And if anybody brought any harm to an albatross, then death or disaster was soon to follow. We're about to witness something absolutely spectacular. A life experience that is unbelievable. Some people like to go to Disneyland for an adventure, but I like places that are a little bit wilder. Disneyland gets about 200,000 visitors in one good long weekend. In the Antarctic, since tourism began, a total of 200,000 visitors. And what's to see here in addition to a few penguins? How about half the world's population of seals, including one big boy that can weigh up to four tons? The southern elephant seal is the world's largest seal. It gets its name from the large nose the adult males use to create extraordinarily loud roaring sounds. An adult bull without rival is the largest carnivore alive. An average adult male weighs six to seven times more than the largest land carnivore, the polar bear. The largest reported bull was shot in South Georgia in 1913 and measured 22 and a half feet long and weighed a mammoth 11,000 pounds. That's almost as large as an African elephant. This beach is covered with hundreds of elephant seals. It's a virtual pavement of blubber. There must be hundreds of tons of these seals. And they're all here doing one thing. They're losing their outer skin. It's called a catastrophic molt. Every spring, for 28 days, these seals will shed their fur, revealing a new dark fur underneath. When molting occurs, the seals are susceptible to the cold, which is why they are on land in a safe place called a haul out. And it's one of the few times you will see an elephant seal out of the water. They're not the sleekest looking bodies on the beach, but put these incredible hulks into the water and you've got a four ton diving machine. Elephant seals routinely dive as deep as 2,000 meters. Some can go up to two hours without surfacing. That iceberg is probably 10 stories high and yet we're only seeing one tenth of its total height. That means we're in deep water and that means we're in the home of the elephant seal. Elephant seals are masters at conserving energy. 12% of their body weight is oxygen storing blood. A full grown bull has 900 pounds of it. When they surface, they hyperventilate to store oxygen. When they dive, they shunt blood to vital organs and their heart rate drops as low as three beats per minute. It sounds incredible, but elephant seals are so efficient when they dive, they actually sleep when they're going down. Might as well get comfortable. A seal that lives to be 20 will spend 18 years under the water. Elephant seals will travel about 60 nautical miles a day when they're out in the open ocean fishing. And they eat primarily squid, but they'll take fish too. And they eat about as much as I weigh every single day.
And there's some new research that indicates that maybe there's more than just feeding going on out in this ocean. In fact, there may be a little bit of hanky-panky happening. If you're a sub-adult male and your chances are virtually zero of breeding with a female on the beach, and the chances of getting whomped by a big beach master is very good, then what's the point of going to the beach in the first place? About 50% of the females seem to be showing up pregnant and giving birth on the beach a year later. So something is definitely happening out there. So perhaps it's more of survival of the sneakiest rather than survival of the fittest. To be here next to so many big mammals like this is an awesome experience. To see these big males jousting like that, to see them all so close together, to watch the steam flow off, this is an awesome experience. These elephant seals will soon head out to sea, and so will I. I'm headed for one of the greatest natural experiences on the planet. This is the island of South Georgia, claimed by Captain James Cook in 1775 for the Kingdom of Great Britain, a wild place of great beauty and isolation. Gritviken is one of the seven whaling stations on the island and was established in 1904. It was phenomenally successful, with 195 whales taken in its first season. But it didn't last long, with rapidly declining whale populations and sharp decrease in the demand for whale oil, it was abandoned by 1966. And apart from a few preserved buildings, only the decaying remains survive. It's a ghostly reminder of a different time, of hardships and adventure. It's also the burial spot for one of history's most intrepid explorers, Sir Ernest Shackleton. In April 1916, during his trans-Antarctic expedition, his ship sank locked in ice, stranding him and his crew. By overcoming numerous obstacles and after being at sea for over a year, Shackleton saved all the lives of his remaining crew. A fitting monument to both this place and Shackleton's formidable legacy. As we travel on, we sail through ice, lots of ice. 90% of the world's fresh water is found here, and the older the ice, the clearer it is. And when it's really old, refracted light turns the ice to a brilliant blue. At times, it feels like you're floating among naturally sculptured ice chapels. And when waters are calm, it adds immensely to that spiritual feeling. You're about to meet a highly specialized bird. It's a bird that doesn't fly, but it can swim probably better than a lot of species of fish. And it's a bird that certainly doesn't mind getting lost in a crowd. This is the Gold Harbor colony of king penguins in South Georgia. It's one of the largest colonies of this species in the world. And for someone who has ever dreamed of walking amongst thousands of wild penguins, this is the place. This is incredible. As far as the eye can see, it's king penguins everywhere. And with an estimated population of three million birds, they're flourishing. These penguins are the second largest of all the penguins behind the emperor penguin. King penguins form huge colonies, sometimes over a hundred thousand pair. And they're constantly at the colony. They're here year round, which is very different than any other kind of penguin. And that's because their chicks take over a year to fledge. When I look out over the colony, I can see lots of groups of fuzzy babies that at this stage are at about the same weight as the adult. But the adults are out in the open ocean fishing. While mom and dad are searching for food, 
young penguins are hanging out in a creche. Creches are groups of chicks guarded only by a few adult birds, sort of like a penguin daycare. And these youngsters will stay on land for up to a full year before they're ready to head out to the sea on their own. All those little brown coats you see out there can't go in the water yet because those feathers aren't waterproof. They're gonna have to molt those feathers off and get their adult swimsuit before they can go swimming. King penguins, like all penguins, can withstand impossibly cold conditions. And they do it by packing together 70 feathers per square inch in four different layers, three under layers and one outer layer that's thickly oiled to keep the water away from the skin. The first documented sighting of penguins dates back to the late 1490s. They were observed by Portuguese explorers and named penguis, Latin for fat. Penguins are constantly pecking at other penguins around them, but especially at skuas and petrels. Those are the bad guys they have to watch out for. And scientists have found out that they'll peck about 2,000 times a day and spend about four hours a day keeping away the bad guys. Walking through a colony of thousands upon thousands of penguins is an exhilarating bucket list experience. There's just nothing else like it and it's been a privilege to meet the bird they call fat. Just when I thought I had seen it all. Life experience that is unbelievable. Nature at its very best. It's time to head out to the open ocean to see if we can find some seals of a different sort. These Antarctic waters have about a half dozen species of seals that we potentially can find. In this shifting, floating wonderland, we look for signs of activity. And it doesn't take long to find a pair of leopard seals catching some sun. Now these guys may look all cute and cuddly, but the fact is, weighing in at a thousand pounds and armed with powerful jaws and long teeth, leopard seals are an Antarctic killing machine. As we move in to get a closer look, the iceberg flips. Whoa! That was, that was cool. That was amazing. And once in the water, we can really see their beauty and predatory skill. They propel themselves with powerful foreflippers reaching speeds of 40 kilometers an hour. Leopard seals rank alongside killer whales as Antarctica's top predator. It is bold, powerful, and curious, and it's been known to hunt people, although its favorite meal is penguin. Completely at home in these icy waters, kings of their domain. Hanging with a leopard seal is an unforgettable experience. We're located on Paulette Island on the northern tip area of the Antarctic Peninsula, right next to the Weddell Sea. A few minutes ago, I saw a leopard seal patrolling the edge of the water. Penguins were rocketing out, obviously aware of the danger. Researchers tell us that up to one and a half percent of the adult population will never return to the colony, taken by predators. This penguin is the Adelis penguin. Of the 17 species of penguins that exist in the world, this and the emperor are the only two species that will nest only on the continent. The places where penguins nest together are called rookeries. Studies have found that these rookeries are often continually used for hundreds, even thousands of years. The oldest found so far 
has been used every year since well before 4000 BC. That's over 6,000 years old. This is one of my favorite penguins. It's the cutest of them all, I think, with the little white eye line. They're absolutely adorable, and they're tough little penguins. The males get here to the breeding site before the female early in the spring, and to get here, they sometimes have to walk across incredible distances of frozen sea ice, up to 60 kilometers. Once they get here, they proclaim their territory as their own, and they patiently wait for their wife to show up. It may seem like utter chaos, but this is home sweet home to some of the most devoted parents in the animal kingdom. Adelie penguins breed and raise their young on the continent of Antarctica, further south than any other penguin. Adelie penguin colonies are very loud, raucous, and smelly affairs. The call of an Adelie is as musical and gentle as scratching glass and the whole colony is awash with guano, which is a posh word for bird poop. An unbelievable sea of noise and confusion. Up to a quarter million pairs of birds in massive colonies. After a hard day's fishing and a wobbly trek back to the colony, how does a penguin locate its mate or its offspring? It helps to have two voice boxes. Each penguin's call has unique amplitudes and frequencies, so unique that chicks often recognize a parent after only a few syllables, which is necessary considering the dress code, and amazing considering the competition. Named after an early French explorer's wife, Adele, this amazing bird symbolizes in many ways what the Antarctic is all about. It's tough, it's beautiful, and it's unique. Pretty much everything this place represents. A trip to the Antarctic is beyond remarkable. I actually think it's one of the best wilderness experiences left on the planet. Once you've been here, it gets under your skin. I can't wait to come back.